Hello, this is Nagina Abdullah, and today I am here with Felish Gersh, uh, MD and a multi-award winning physician with dual board certifications in OBGYN and integrative medicine. She is the founder and director of the Integrative Medical Group of Irvine, which provides comprehensive health care for women by combining the best evidence based therapies from conventional naturopathic and holistic medicine. Felice is a prolific writer and lecturer who speaks globally on women's health issues and regularly publishes in peer reviewed medical journals. She's been featured in several films and documentary series, including The Real Skinny on Fat with Montel Williams and Fasting with Walter Longo, PhD. Felice is the best selling author of PCOS SOS, the PCOS SOS Fertility Fast Track, and her latest book, Menopause 50 Things You Need to Know. Hello, Felice. How are you today? Welcome. Well, thank you. I'm doing just fine. I'm so thrilled to have this opportunity to chat about such important topics. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Well, I am so excited to jump in. We're going to really be talking in depth about the link between estrogen and metabolism and how to lose weight with all of the hormonal changes um, with a deep dive on into estrogen today. And so what I'd love to start off with is to ask you a little bit about how did you decide to um, now focus on menopause? I know that you were very focused on PCOS, which is a major area, something that I see a lot with, with my clients in terms of PCOS and and the resistance to weight loss that that can that can uh, that that can encourage. How did you transition from there to menopause? What is kind of the the area of menopause that has interested you to to share? Well, interestingly enough, PCOS and menopause have a great deal in common that's not really recognized, and it's all about estrogen. Women with PCOS have a difficulty in producing estrogen in the ovaries, estradiol. The ovarian produced estrogen. And of course, women in menopause ultimately can't make any estrogen from their ovaries at all. And understanding the incredibly important role that estrogen plays in all metabolic functions and metabolism is the production, utilization, distribution, storage of energy, which is critical for health and reproduction. That's all linked together. Then it was an easy transition. I still deal with PCOS, but it's like a natural transition. Once you really embrace the role that estrogen plays in the female body, it's just a natural transition as women age to look at other ways that estrogen can impact all of the metabolic functions of women. Okay, absolutely. Okay, so that's that's actually so interesting. That's a very natural link. And, um, and something I'm really excited to talk more about today because it's such a area of, of kind of just of, of new understanding as women are coming into menopause of what's happening with their body. A lot of women start to feel naturally that they're, they're experiencing more belly fat or what, what is, what worked before isn't working anymore. And so I, I'm so excited to sh for you to share the science behind that. And let's get started by talking about can you just can you share, you know, does menopause lead to weight gain? Is that really happening? Is there a biological change in women's bodies? Are women just feeling like they're not doing enough and like they have to do more of what they were doing? Or, you know, what is that relationship? Why is menopause creating weight gain? Is that actually really happening? Yes, the answer in a simple one word answer is yes. Menopause invariably leads to a change in the distribution and the production of adipose tissue, AKA fat, okay? So energy distribution utilization is critical for reproductive success. So you have to have an animal and remember that humans are part of the animal kingdom. You have to have a situation where energy intake which is eating food, matches the energy needs of the body. This is a very finely tuned process. And when everything is right and you have the proper hormones and you have the proper environment, you don't have endocrine disruptors and everything else that we deal with today, which just magnifies the issues. When everything is right, the body knows how much to eat to regulate what the body needs are. And 
all of the cells in the body have the tools to actually utilize the food to create the proper energy and to store just the right amount so that you don't have this imbalance between intake and storage of energy in the form of glycogen, which is like the storage form of glucose and fat, which is storage of fat, and so that you have just the right balance. Well, it turns out, most people don't know this, that estrogen, and it's not just estrogen because estrogen is a family of hormones and the estrogen that the ovaries make is E2, estradiol. That this particular hormone, estradiol, is really the master of metabolic control. It regulates appetite centers. It regulates the mitochondria, the little factories of energy production in every cell. It also regulates adipose tissue. It dictates where it's deposited and, and the whole immune system in terms of turning on and turning off inflammation, which is another critical factor. All of these functions are under the auspices of estradiol. So when you don't have adequate estradiol or ultimately you don't have any produced by the ovaries, then all of these metabolic functions, regulation of appetite, and distribution of fat, creation of, of fat, and the ability to burn fat, all of those functions become offline. They're still working to some degree because you can make estradiol in certain tissues. That's how men get estradiol, but women don't do it as well. And they don't have as many precursors like testosterone is a precursor of estradiol. All estradiol is derived from testosterone, but of course women don't make enough and we're not designed like men to convert it in local tissues into estradiol. So women in menopause live in a body of serious estradiol deficiency, which means Every aspect of metabolism, the creation, utilization, storage, everything relating to energy is not functioning optimally. And when you don't have enough estradiol, you get into this default situation, which every woman has noticed, you start depositing fat around the middle, the belly area. And you, you just don't know why this is happening. And it's really important to understand what's happening and then, of course, like we talked about before we started, we're going to end by talking about positive steps that every woman, so it does it can take, because we don't want this to be doomsday. It's not that at all. But it's so critical to understand that you can do everything the same. I hear this every day, like, I'm not changing what I'm eating, how I'm exercising, or maybe I'm doing more. But guess what? I can't seem to change. My body is morphing. Things are changing. I don't feel the same. My body doesn't look the same. And it all revolves around that magical hormone, my personal favorite, estradiol, that form of estrogen that the ovaries make, which we cease to make when we're in a menopausal state. Okay. Okay. So that's that, that, it, okay. So th that's so helpful because, you know, it, it helps women see, you're not doing anything wrong. It's not, it's not like you are taking the wrong action. There's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but, but it's more about understanding that now there's a change that's happening to your body. So you have to learn how to respond to these changes. And it's really, I feel like something that is not talked about enough because women just end up going into perimenopause and then menopause and not really knowing that these things are going to happen as a result of these hormonal changes. We just know the word menopause or perimenopause but what does that mean for us? So yeah, so this is very helpful. So I wanna just ask you a couple clarifying questions for people that are coming in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, learning this as a beginner. Um, you mentioned estradiol <clears throat> is a form of um, estrogen caused by the ovaries. So is what is the difference between estradiol and estrogen? Like, is there other forms of estrogen that are created and should we be concerned with those? And, um, and then can you talk about the, 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 the ups and downs of estradiol during perimenopause and menopause? Like, does it go away right away? Is it, does it go up first and then down? Like, what are women experiencing? Well, I think that understanding that estrogen is not a hormone is so critical because estrogen, that term is thrown around in such a crazy wild way. In fact, estrogen is used to even talk about 
chemicals that would never exist in a normal female ever, ever, ever. Like they're manufactured chemicals that technically by definition would be labeled estrogen endocrine disruptors. So, and, and this is important because people talk about birth control pills. Well, they're estrogen. But the estrogen that's in a birth control pill, which in some women actually also can cause weight gain, it's ethanol estradiol. It's a man-made chemical that can bind to estrogen receptors and create various effects, but it's not the same as what the ovary makes. It's a different molecule. And even a little bit of change in a molecule can make a huge difference. So technically, actually, if you looked it up, it's an endocrine disruptor. An endocrine disruptor is any chemical, it could be natural or mostly man-made, that interferes with any aspect of a hormone, like the production, distribution, utilization, it's degradation, it's elimination. So it can interfere with any or all of those different facets. But all the endocrine disruptors out there are often referred to as estrogen. So in the human female adult, there are three estrogens and they're labeled, think of it like B vitamins, right? Now, B vitamins are different. There's B1, which is thiamine, B2, which is riboflavin, you know, B12, which is cobalamin. And nobody says if you have a B12 deficiency, you should take B1. I mean, it's like they're specific, but they're in the same family. So in estrogens, in adult females, there's three. E1, they're labeled with a letter and a number, and that's estrone. And estrone is the dominant estrogen of menopausal women. And it binds to one of the receptors. So most hormonal action occurs by the hormone binding to a receptor. So think of it like food going into the mouth. You know, the food is like the hormone and the receptor is the mouth, right? And the mouth can be open or closed. So receptors can be like welcoming or not so welcoming. They can actually like shape shift depending on the situation. And so E1 estrone acts predominantly on one estrogen receptor that's called the alpha receptor. And that is the estrone is produced in menopausal women, predominantly in fat tissue. So there's an enzyme called aromatase that exists in many organs of the body and definitely in fat tissue and especially in a pro-inflammatory state, like inflammation in the body, it upregulates or activates that enzyme. And that enzyme converts androgens. They're like male type hormones, but women have them too, which come mostly from the adrenal gland. And then the fat tissue converts it into estrogen. And the estrogen type that it makes is estrone that activates only the alpha receptor, which has a totally different effect than estradiol E2, which is the estrogen made by ovaries, which has a balanced effect on all the different estrogen receptors, which is alpha and beta, and then a separate membrane receptor. And then there's estriol, that's E3. That's the dominant estrogen of a pregnant woman made in the placenta. Now in a reproductive aged woman, you have all of these estrogens, but in different proportions, estriol being the smallest amount because they can all be derived from estradiol, can convert into estrone and also into estriol, but only when the body needs it, it's directed to do it when it needs to. And estriol binds predominantly to the beta receptor. So that's why, and to understanding what goes on in pregnancy actually helps to understand something about menopause too, because it's all these hormones have specific roles within the family of estrogens. Then there's a fetal estrogen, which we won't even go into, E4. But that is now, the only reason I mention that is because there are pharmaceutical companies that are actually starting to manufacture E4, and they're thinking of using it in pharmaceuticals for adult women, which to me seems nonsensical because it doesn't ever naturally exist in adult women. So why are you doing that just because you can? Well, anyway, another story of pharmaceutical business. But in terms of how these different estrogens relate to the different receptors creates different effects. 
So it turns out that estradiol with its balanced effect balances off all of the metabolic functions. It's like a balanced effect so that the body gets and does what it needs to right on the spot. When you only have one, it sort of pushes in a certain direction. So if you think of it as the on and off switch for everything, estradiol regulates the on switch for everything and the off switch. So in a way you can think of estrone, which regulates and only binds to alpha receptor is kind of like the on switch, the on switch for like wanting to eat, the on switch for creating inflammation. So when you have only estrone being produced, and it turns out interestingly, that when you have a lot of inflammation, which is sort of underlying a lot of the problems of aging, the diseases of aging are all related to this unrelenting inflammation, which happens in women in menopausal states. And when you have a lot of inflammation, it causes the enzyme that allows the conversion of estrone back into estradiol to be predominantly blocked. So you get stuck in estrone. So you have this imbalance of the wrong type of estrogen that dominates the female body in a menopausal woman. Only estradiol gives the balance effect of all the good opportunities for the body to stay in a proper state. Like in the mitochondria, these little structures called organelles that are in every cell that are there to create energy. They burn fat, okay? That requires estradiol. And in the brain, in the hypothalamus, um, and in the cerebral cortex, you have different types of estrogen receptors. For the brain to work properly, in, in every respect, you need the balance of the different estrogen receptors to be able to be activated, which requires estradiol. So all of these things become offline when you don't have proper estradiol. And in pregnancy, pregnancy is a unique state when the body has to gain weight fast, right? Pregnant women can put on fat really fast, even if they're not eating too much. And that's because the estriol that you have and the changes in the hormones, it just all relates to changing the gut microbiome, which is another big topic. I'm sure that you're being going to be touching on that a lot in your summit. And the gut microbiome can also have a huge impact on fat burning and inflammation and metabolism, much more than we ever, ever understood. And in pregnancy, the microbiome changes and it creates a low level of inflammation and leaky gut. And this creates an increase of insulin resistance. And when you have insulin resistance, then it takes more insulin in order to use, um, to get the blood sugar that's circulating out of the blood and into the cells that need it to create energy. Well, when you have a lot of insulin and blood sugar is rising and insulin in the blood, that promotes the production of fat. So insulin is essential for life, but it promotes the production and storage of fat, which is why pregnant women can put on weight so quickly. But it's a very finely tuned system. And a lot of women cross the line and they get gestational diabetes. Well, it's not the same situation, but a similar thing happens in menopausal women. They have an abnormal gut microbiome because estradiol is key to regulating the gut microbiome and the little enzymes and the hormones that are produced by the gut lining cells that help to create proper digestion and proper regulation of appetite and feedback for the systems. And so you end up with what's called impaired gut barrier or leaky gut. And this creates a similar inflammatory state, which leads to insulin resistance when you have total body-wide inflammation. So you have higher levels of blood sugar, you have higher levels of insulin circulating, which also promotes the production and storage of fat. And it turns out that we didn't know this, but estradiol itself is key to certain structures and molecules called 
glucose transporters that enable the glucose to get out of the blood and into the cells. So all women as they transition into menopause have a multitude of issues, including leaky gut, and glucose transport will say malfunction, higher levels of insulin. So they have more tendency towards insulin resistance, which also leads to weight gain. So it's like not, nothing is totally simple. There's actually a multitude of ways that loss of estradiol, I call it not a sex hormone, I call it a life hormone, can change your metabolism, your ability to utilize glucose, your ability to utilize and burn fat. So, and it goes even beyond this, which we can talk about because the circadian rhythm becomes abnormally functioning and circadian rhythm allows the organs to all work in the same time zone. And we know that when women are like living a life of jet lag, they're flying across time zones that they invariably have a weight gain issue. And women in menopause essentially live a life of perpetual jet lag. So that's another way that women can gain weight in menopause. So there's a, like a multitude of ways that, you know, things kind of work against women as they transition into menopause to cause weight gain. Oh my gosh. Okay. That is so helpful. That is such an amazing level of detail that I know many women were, you know, we, we hear about estrogen. We don't hear about the breakdown of the three to four different actual, actually four different types of estrogen. Um, and then how they relate to each other and the, and the, and the necessity to bind to the right receptors to create that balance. And so, um, so I want to talk a little bit also, I want to ask you one more question about that and then talk also about that link between what's happening when, when, when we're not converting, um, like estrone is not being converted to estradiol in the right amounts. Um, is, like, is there a link there around what's causing weight gain? Like, is that something that, that women can work on? Is that something that could be going, you know, be, be a dysfunction in women's bodies that they could work on? Or is it just something that naturally happens for women during menopause? And then like moving forward from that, really, where, how is this, can you talk about the link between belly fat and like adding on belly fat from, look, how is that happening and why is that happening? Well, everything that a woman can do, and this is really key, everything she can do to keep inflammation in her body down and to maintain a healthy gut microbiome and maintain a healthy gut barrier so she doesn't have leaky gut. All of those things are going to help dramatically to keep adipose tissue from forming in the first place and also reduce the activation of that enzyme, you know, aromatase to convert the androgens into estrone. And when you don't have so much inflammation, then the enzyme that can convert estrone into estradiol won't be blocked. So how it's really all about keeping inflammation down. And inflammation is a life-saving activity of the body. You know, if you can't create inflammation, then you will die because you won't be able to fend off invading pathogens like bacteria and viruses. You won't be able to deal with injured tissue, damaged tissue, or have the ability to gobble up dead cells. You know, every cell has a lifespan, you know, and if it dies, you don't want to have a body of dead cells just accumulating. You got to have these macrophages, these specialized immune cells to gobble it up. And immune cells regulate bone growth and, and resorption. I mean, you need to have a functioning immune system. And part of that is appropriate activation of an inflammatory response. The problem is estradiol turns on and turns off the inflammatory switch, we'll say. And when you don't have it, you go into this sort of on switch perpetual mode where you have always inflammation. So one of the things that can be amazingly helpful are the, I call it the magic ingredients of plants. They're the phytoestrogens. In fact, many foods that are called superfoods actually are superfoods for the reason that they have phytoestrogens in them. So these are not actually estrogens. They're actually plant-based molecules that can bind to estrogen receptors and help to create a similar 
response as if you had estrogen. For example, like one food is called pomegranates and pomegranates have a polyphenol that's a phytoestrogen in it that's called ellagic acid. And then in the gut with the right microbiome, it can turn into the urolithins, which act in the mitochondria to promote fat burning and creation of energy. And every food that we know of has a phytoestrogen component. They're different, like the legumes and the, the beans, you know, and the lentils. And of course, soybeans are the ones that have the most attention, but they have the isoflavones, which are phytoestrogens. And then apples, which are amazing, and they're really kind of everyone's talking about apples again, they have quercetin, which is a regulator of mast cells. Those are the first responders that create inflammation of the immune cells. They help to quiet it down and reduce inflammation. So they have the polyphenol, which is a phytoestrogen quercetin. And then like red grapes, are part of, they have part of the still bean family, which includes resveratrol, which also is what we call a fasting mimetic. It gives a similar effect in the body as if you were fasting and fasting is a trigger, which is another tool. Fasting is a trigger to fat burning. So by eating like red grapes can be beneficial. And then nuts and seeds have lignans, and these are also phytoestrogens. In fact, people have tried, and there's actually published articles that people who eat flax seeds, for example, can help to become more fertile and regulate their menstrual cycles. And these are phytoestrogens. So uh, these magical foods can dramatically help women in the menopause. In fact, um, Neil Bernard, who's a, a famous vegan advocate, cardiologist, he had a study not that long ago, within the last couple of years, where he had women eat like a cup of soybeans every day. Of course, I say organic, please, you know, organic soybeans every day. And by 12 weeks, these women who had a lot of hot flashes, which is a sign of dysregulation um, in your brain of your thermoregulatory centers, the regulatory centers that control temperature, that these centers came back online and almost 100% of women had almost 100% resolution of their night sweats and hot flashes by eating a cup of soybeans every day. So this is really amazing, you know, that we can access these phytoestrogens in foods to help us to regulate our metabolic function. So that is, you know, I don't want anyone to leave thinking this is completely hopeless. And by lowering inflammation, then you will lower the production of estrone, which is really a pro inflammatory estrogen. And, and unfortunately, that's what's given, you know, estradiol, it's like the evil twin, you know, and it's not evil, it's just out of balance, right? Mm -hmm. And like anything, if it's out of balance can harm you, right? You can die from water intoxication, but you can't live without it. So, you know, when you have this imbalance of the estrogens in the body, then you get into trouble. And um, the other thing is I talked about circadian rhythm. Well, it turns out that every life form on earth, every life form has clock genes. And these clock genes are designed for survival, for optimal survival on planet earth, which has a 24 rotation on its axis. And that's, you know, 24 hour day and humans are diurnal. So we have a totally different metabolic status in the day and at night and other animals are nocturnal like rodents are nocturnal and owls are nocturnal. Well, when women go through menopause, because the master clock that sits atop the optic nerve and senses light and dark, but also can have sensors for nutrients, that this becomes like a little offline. We call it drifting because estradiol is a key player in keeping that circadian clock on the beat, keeping it on, on time. And we now know, like I mentioned, that if you drift off that proper time, then you start becoming metabolically unhealthy and you gain weight, you gain belly fat, everything becomes malfunctional. So by eating at the right time, like time, what we call time-restricted eating, by helping even the gut microbes, it's amazing. They have clock genes, but they don't know what time it is. So you can actually help set their clocks to create the proper response to create 
proper melatonin production to create also the gut to make GLP-1. Now that is the little hormone that gut lining cells make that's so like trendy now with the drugs like in it's in Manjaro along with another peptide and also Wagovi, Ozempic, you know, these are the weight loss drugs that are so trendy now. Well, this is made by the gut and it helps if you keep the timing right, if you eat fiber, and also if you take supplemental estradiol, uh, but you can actually help your body to make its natural hormone to regulate appetite and to control fat burning. That's really what that's all about. So you can do it with a drug that's a mimic, or you can do it through lifestyle modification along with estradiol replacement, which I'm a big advocate for because unfortunately, no matter what we do, it's never going to be as good as having 21 year old ovaries, but we can come closer if we combine all of the different lifestyle modalities, along with physiologic replacement of the hormones that our ovaries cease to make, recognizing that even though it's natural, it's not naturally beneficial, right? So it's okay that something's natural. In medicine, by the way, everything we do is unnatural. I mean, I, you know, like we try to use the most natural, I try to use the most natural ways to restore health, but even doing that is unnatural, right? So, you know, you just have to accept that we're trying to avoid the natural processes of aging, which in women includes additional production of belly fat and all the harms that come from that. It's not just appearance, which is, you know, bad for our self-esteem, but it also increase our, increases our risk of heart attacks and strokes and dementia and osteoporosis. We don't want any of that, you know, osteoarthritis. So there are definitely ways that we can help to lower the, the belly fat by lowering inflammation through time-restricted eating through the proper choice of foods, the magical plants, avoiding processed foods. You know, any they create inflammation and gut dysbiosis and leaky gut. So avoid all processed food. If it has chemicals on a label, don't eat it. I mean, you just go back to natural food from earth. That is like really, really key. And to also not be so hard on yourself, to know that no matter what you do, you're going to be a little bit of a different person when you transition into menopause. So, you know, we want to do the best we can. In fact, they've done studies of women who are thin, but even on very thin women in menopause, if they do like CAT scans, they find that they have excessive amounts of internal fat, like they call it visceral fat. And so I did not create this label, but they call them the skinny fats because their body composition isn't really healthy. And, and but they have in sort of this invisible fat that's inside. So we really wanna do everything for ultimately optimal health. And so it's not just about weight or you know your BMI, it's about body composition. And it's about how much lean body mass you have. And that's another really important topic because most people don't know that estradiol is key to maintaining bone, which most people know that, you know, when you lose your estrogen from your ovaries, you start losing your bone, but also muscle mass, mm -hmm. that maintaining muscle is key to maintaining your weight. Muscle is the prime organ of the body that burns glucose. And if you don't have enough muscle, what does glucose that you don't burn turn into? Fat, you know, that's what it does. So maintaining muscle mass is so critical for women transitioning and then staying the rest of their lives in menopause. And having estradiol through replacement is very important, but also maintaining adequate protein intake and having all of the magical plants with their antioxidants and polyphenols, which lower inflammation and allow the production of muscle and doing weight resistance exercises, even just two or three times a week can really help to maintain muscle mass. If you lose your muscle, regaining it is so hard, really, really hard. And it's think of muscle as the key part of your body that burns glucose. And that is key because if you can't burn it, you're going to store it and you're going to store it as fat. And when you don't have enough estrogen, 
the fat goes to the belly. That's the default. So, you know, think of it as like with the fat distribution and regulation of fat is so key. So think if you had two fraternal twins, a boy and a girl, okay? And they're six years old and they have a sort of a nutty mother who treats them as if they're clones of each other and puts them in the same little overalls and they take all the same lessons and they go to the same class and they eat the same food. So they do everything the same. They even, she even gives them little cute boy haircuts, you know, she's sort of nutty. And they look so alike when they're six. Well, now, why don't we fast forward and now they're 20. Okay, those little six year olds are 20. And they still been doing all their lives, eating the same food, living in the same house, <clears throat> doing all the same piano lessons and everything else the same. Well, they're 20 years old, they're not going to look anything alike. Why is that? Because they have different hormones. The male of the twin he's going to have all that testosterone. He's going to build all that muscle. He's going to be six pack and he's going to be a guy. And then the girl, she has all that estrogen. She's going to put on some fat on her hips, her butt, her breasts. She's going to get that little hourglass shape. Hormones are destiny. Okay. So even if you eat all the same stuff and everything, if you don't have the same hormones, you're going to look differently and you're going to think differently because hormones affect the brain in all kinds of ways. So understanding that where fat goes and how fat works is so dependent on hormones is so critical. And we now know that adipose tissue, fat tissue, it's not just about storage of energy. It's actually an endocrine organ. So like, for example, one, there's like a couple of hormones, they're called adipokines that are made by fat tissue, and they're regulated by estradiol. One is leptin. A lot of people have heard of leptin. Well, leptin has many metabolic functions. Among them is regulation of appetite, telling your body time to stop eating. Or, you know, you know, maybe it should, you, the leptin goes down, then, oh, time to eat. Okay. Well, when you have a lot of inflammation, you can have leptin resistance, just like you can have insulin resistance. So the leptin no longer works and you don't produce it properly because all of that is controlled by estradiol, the production of leptin. So then guess what? Your brain doesn't know, like, is it time to eat? Should I eat? Should I stop eating? So you don't have appetite regulation and like, you don't know when to stop eating. It's like, they've done studies where they'll put out a buffet. It's all like, you know, staged. The people don't know they're in a study. They think they're going to watch a movie premiere or something. They're like given a false premise and they go and they're given a buffet and it's like Italian buffet. And they eat to their fill. They eat all the food. And then they put out another buffet. It's a Chinese food buffet. And they say, oh, we forgot to put these foods out. So we're going to put it out anyway. And they'll just eat another whole dinner. They just ate a whole Italian dinner. Now they're going to eat a whole Chinese food dinner. Like what happened to their appetite type control? Oh, it's not there. They'll just do that. They've shown that like you give them a tub of popcorn and they'll just keep eating it. Like, like, excuse me, like the tub is this big, you know, nothing will stop them. They have no appetite control. And then another adipokine is adiponectin. Adiponectin is a hormone from fat tissue that controls burning of fat. And you need to have high levels to burn fat and create energy. Well, without enough estrogen, adiponectin goes low and you just can't burn fat. So what a great combo. You don't know when to stop eating and you can't burn fat. And that's controlling your adipose tissue, which is estradiol. So that's why eating the plants that have this, you know, phytoestrogens can be very helpful along with doing everything you can to keep your circadian rhythm right and then getting supplemental hormones. And because no matter what we do, 100% of women go through menopause. Like there are certain things that you can control through meditation and exercise. and You can't stop menopause. You may delay it a few months, but you're not going to stop it. So accepting what is and understanding it is really the first steps to controlling it, mastering, I can call it like mastering menopause and by understanding it, because we can do so much to prevent the inexorable issues that are really designated as aging issues, but they're not. They're really deficiency of estrogen, estradiol issues, really. And we need to call a spade a spade. Loss of estradiol 
is loss of metabolic control of the body. Okay. Oh my gosh. And I really love how you shared, you know, like you've put the, the, this into, into kind of a, a very easy to understand framework of what can be done to really balance estradiol in terms of eating more protein, like you were mentioning, um, having the right phytonutrients from plants that are going to help you. And then also the resistance training. So like those three things are kind of like cornerstones to healthy, healthy menopause, like getting through menopause in a healthy way. Now, so we talked about how inflammation is the major, you know, is the reason for a lack of the right amount of estradiol. Um, but then also the fact that like, there still is belly fat that is going to usually that is going to collect around the belly. Is that something that could be prevented by that by those three cornerstones, by by eating in the right way, doing resistance training, eating, having plants, will that help to prevent that belly fat, or is that a result of estrog estrogen and general estradiol decreasing during menopause, and and as and then the a hormone replacement being required? Well, I'm a firm believer in preventive medicine. Okay, so once someone like and I have patients that come in to see me every day and say they have not been on any hormones, they haven't done any of these lifestyle you know, techniques, and now they're 65 and they've been in menopause for say 15 years. Um, there's just so much we can do. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything. We should do tons of stuff. We can help a lot, but we're not going to reverse everything. You know, It's like someone who shows up and they have end stage osteoporosis. There's still a lot that can be done, but we're not going to rebuild her that her bones to be that of a 35 year old. It's just not possible at this time, but we can do a lot. So at any stage, no matter what stage a woman is in, we can do a lot, but the optimal time is really perimenopause. And I have actually changed my own practice over the last several years because I was also a little bit brainwashed. I mean, I've had to de brainwash myself a lot from the conventional medical approach, which is to not even think about giving hormones, if of course, they're pretty much anti hormones, but not even to consider hormones until you've reached sort of the end of the road. And really the official definition of menopause 12 consecutive months without any bleeding is really the end of the road of the process of ovarian aging, which is really what this process should be looked at. And the loss of the menstrual cycle is really a consequence of loss of the hormones. And really we should rethink the whole way that we frame menopause, not into loss of your period or change of your periods, but loss of these vital life hormones, which will manifest as changes in your cycles, and then ultimately no cycles. Because after all, if a woman had a hysterectomy, she still goes through menopause, but there's no meno, you know, to pause, right? Because, you know, meno is about the lunar menstrual cycle. So we have to like rethink it, reframe it as a process, not crossing a finish line. It's not like, I hear it like, Am I in menopause yet? I haven't had a period for nine months. It's like, like, stop thinking of it that way. You're in ovarian aging process, okay? And it doesn't really matter. It's arbitrary. So I mean, some committee of people just made up a definition of 12 consecutive months. First of all, when they bleed, we don't know if it's really ovulatory bleeding or dysfunctional uterine bleeding. And what the heck? It could be 11 months. It could be 14 months. It's just made up stuff. Okay. So we have to rethink it. It's ovarian aging or senescence and reduction of hormones. But along the way, like you had mentioned this earlier, so it's a projection, a, you know, trajectory down, but along the way down, it can have spikes up. So kind of like down, but up and then down and up. So the perimenopause can be like a roller coaster of hormones because it can go high, then it goes low, then it goes high, then it goes low. And one way that we can try to sort of ameliorate these like gigantic swings with the trend always down is by doing all the lifestyle things, you know, getting adequate sleep and eating the right foods and exercising, you know, all these things will help to maintain a little bit more of a, like less of a roller coaster, but it's still going to be trajectory down, which is why I am now an advocate for hormone supplementation. So I think of it as supplementation during the perimenopause, like the 
the transition years, which can be multiple years, you know, it's variable for different women, but think of it on average of maybe five years before that so-called, you know, final menopause last period. And during that time, if you supplement with hormones and you can do testing like a menstrual mapping test, so you can actually see, even if you're having cycles, that doesn't mean that your hormones are right. I can tell you, I've seen it, you know, that like, even like women who have PMS, they may not produce enough hormones, you know, even though they're having cycles. And so they can benefit from supplemental hormones while you're working to help their bodies to produce as much as you can. And I'll, I'll touch on that too. Like, how can you maximize the lifespan of your ovaries? Because as even adding a few months of hormonal production actually is gold, okay? So by think of it like thyroid, like when women and women are the ones that get the most thyroid replacement therapy too, but you know, men too, but women more than men. So if you think of women who take thyroid, well, it's not that their thyroid makes nothing, you know, like unless you've had your thyroid removed because of thyroid cancer or you had say Graves disease or something else, you know, where it was destroyed by radioactive iodine, forget that, that whole thing. You know, if you just have like typical hypothyroidism, your thyroid gland still makes thyroid. It just doesn't make enough. So we give additional thyroid, right? So we're not saying you don't have any, we're just saying you don't make enough. So that's how I now think of the hormones from the ovary. If you're in the perimenopause, you don't make enough. You still make some, but you don't make enough. So I'm going to supplement it. Then if you had something like Graves' disease and you had iodine destruct, you know, had to have your eye, your whole thyroid destroyed, or you had it removed because of cancer or something, and you have no thyroid, then it's total replacement. Well, that's what happens when you go through menopause and then your ovarian production is zero, like there's none made, then it's total replacement. So you go from supplementation to replacement and you add in everything else with the lifestyle, with the diet, the exercise, the sleep, the stress reduction. Oh, goodness gracious. You definitely have to do a mind body practice, whether it's guided imagery or meditation or tapping or progressive relaxation. There's a whole host of ways that you can do mind body medicine, which is hugely important because it helps regulate properly the autonomic nervous system, which is also controlled by estradiol and becomes dysregulated. And so that's really, really important. But understanding that this is something that every woman faces and just think of it like thyroid. I mean, we just have to stop thinking of it as, well, we never would want to touch hormones or they're evil or something. That's ridiculous. Think of it like if you have low thyroid, you're going to take thyroid. If you don't have a thyroid hormone, you're going to get thyroid hormone. I mean, it's if you don't have ovarian function or it's not optimal anymore because you're in the perimenopause, then you go on the hormones and you take the bioidentical hormones that the identical to what the ovaries made. And we do the best to kind of mimic the levels and rhythms, it's not the same. That's why no matter how hard we try to give hormones to a menopausal or perimenopausal woman, it's not the same as when you make it yourself naturally. That's why it's never, it's, I call it necessary, but not sufficient. If you don't add in all the other lifestyle components, you're not going to be where you should be. That's why I hate like hormone clinics or online where they just throw out hormones to people. That's not sufficient. You need to deal with the whole person and all of their lifestyle habits, their stressors, their, their exposures to chemicals, their diets, their sleep, their fitness status. All these things are critically important for healthy longevity for women and men too. But, you know, I focus on women. So it's not inevitable. When you start all these things in the perimenopausal years, you can actually prevent all of those things that we talked about. You know, you can stem the loss of bone and muscle and memory issues like, oh, you can't remember anybody's name. By the way, that's like been proven to happen. And that belly fat. You can prevent insulin resistance. You can prevent that adipose dysregulation and deposits all over your belly and visceral around your organs and the onset of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, dysbiosis of your gut microbiome, leaky gut. I 100% believe that by starting hormones in a supplemental way, along with all the lifestyle stuff, because the hormones alone are not sufficient, by doing all of that, you can prevent all of these 
like undesirable issues that women face when they go into this hormonal deficiency status. We can do it. Now, if you've already passed that point, you know, then, okay, we start wherever you are, right? We start and we start right now doing everything possible. And, you know, and then by the way, in terms of like fasting, they have now, there's data that shows that by doing certain types of fasting, another whole gigantic topic that you can actually lose the body somehow when you do certain fasting types of, you know, like multi-day fasting, but not like multi-week. I mean, we're just talking a few days, um, either with fasting mimicking diets or water fasts. If you know, you've got, these should be done with somebody watching you and talking to you, in my opinion, who's a medical professional or, you know, somebody who knows what they're doing. I don't think you should just do everything on your own, but by, in terms of uh, time during eating during the day, yes. But in terms of multi-day fasting, I think you should have some supervision, but in terms of doing that, there's now articles that show that you can actually burn visceral fat. It's like the body chooses to burn the bad inflammatory fat and the fat in the liver and the fat that also accumulates in the pancreas and in the muscle and in the heart. Because if you have fatty liver, you're going to have fatty pancreas and fatty heart and fatty muscle. You have this what inappropriate fat deposits in many organs. But when you do these different forms of fasting, you can actually burn that really sort of toxic fat that occurs. And that really is like a miracle. So we there are ways that even when you have these problems, we can do a lot of reversal. Oh my gosh. Okay. So that's so helpful to, yes, to, to, to like, the, I really love how this is a very, very comprehensive solution. And it's really not about like jumping into hormone replacement therapy, though that is also going to help you, especially in those perimenopausal years, it is going to, to protect you. It is going to help alleviate all these issues, but, but first starting, if you can, if you're at that place, but really at, at any point, starting with those lifestyle, natural changes, doing that, because that's going to be so powerful and then layering on, but not necessarily being afraid of getting these supplement, getting the supplementation that's going to help. Um, that is really busting a lot of myths because there's so much, there's, there's these past studies out there that show you know a lot of things that are not really true that are outdated that people are still believing about the fact of uh, hormone replacement therapy but it's like doing it in this staged way in this in this coordinated way um which which would make so much sense um well dr gersh you have shared just so much valuable information i cannot thank you enough and i we're not done because you actually have brought a free gift that I wanted to have you talk about. Um, if, if the, for those of you that are just like completely amazed and wowed by what you've already heard, well, there's so much more because Dr. Gersh has written several books and she's gonna share a, a free gift that she has. So if you can share the free gift um, that you've brought for us and then also let us know how can others find out more about you? How can they see the work you're doing, see what types of services you provide and just follow you? Well, I, my most recent book is Menopause, 50 Things You Need to Know. And it really details, it's in broken menopause into the three stages of menopause, the perimenopause, and then the first 10 years of menopause, and then the, the years thereafter. Even because women at different stages do face some different issues and challenges. And then, so it presents all the different issues that women face along with solutions. So it's not just, here's your problems, lady. It's also, okay, what can you do about it? And in addition, um, I well, in terms of what I do, I'm an old fashioned doctor. I have an office, a brick and mortar office. I see patients in person, but also telemedicine every day, Monday through Friday, you know, I'm, I'm really a working doc. And so I, you know, my primary thing is I see patients one-on-one -on -one and I deal with them for their, their individual needs, you know, cause I don't do like, a, you know, everybody's the same, you know, like cookie cutter type of thing. And um, in terms of what I do, I have Instagram that is DR period Felice Gersh. And I try to do regular postings and some, you know, videos and things. And they also get archived on my YouTube channel. And um, in terms of the gift, I have, I hope you like it. It's a, an ebook that I wrote called Menopause SOS. And it really is a lifestyle book. And it tells you all the things that you can do 
from a lifestyle perspective to optimize your health through the menopausal years. Amazing. Oh my gosh. Well, that's going to be such a gem of a resource. And that link is right below this video, um, as well as how you can get in contact with Dr. Gersh um, from Instagram and from her website um, and, and find out more about what she's doing. I want to thank you so much for spending your, your time of this busy day that I know you're most likely in between patients sharing this information. You know, it's really valuable for thousands of women to start to understand what's happening, what's changing, and what can we do to take to take back control because we can once we're aware of it and and once we start taking some different kinds of actions than before um so i want to thank you so much for for your valuable insight and for your time today my pleasure